Was the anti-Semitism crisis in the British Labour Party real or contrived? And if so, to what purpose? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program. I'm Mu'ain Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking once again with Jamie Stern Viner. Jamie Stern Viner is a doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford, where he researches the politics of anti-Semitism. His edited collection on anti-Semitism and the Labour Party is available as a free ebook from the Verso Books website, and it's very highly recommended on this particular issue. Jamie, it's a real pleasure to welcome you back to Connections. Great to be here. Thanks for having me again. Um, so let's uh, start with getting a proper understanding of what was termed the labor anti-Semitism crisis. What was it exactly? What did it consist of? And what was the broader political context in which it emerged? Yeah, so the labor anti-Semitism controversy refers in a nutshell to the claim that under and because of the leadership of the left wing uh, MP Jeremy Corbyn uh, between 2015 and um, up to Labour's electoral defeat in December 2019, that Labour, in a sense, in essence, became an anti-Semitic party. It's and, important... and had not been so prior to his assumption of the party leadership. Is that correct? Exactly. Um, and it's important, I think, to um, remind people at the outset, or just to clarify for people who weren't following um, this at the time, um, just what the nature of the Labour anti-Semitism allegation actually was. It was never merely that there was some anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Such a claim would have been unexceptional, un unobjectionable, obviously true, banal. Um, the claim uh, was not that. The claim was rather that there was a crisis of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. I just want to read a sample of quotes uh, from mainstream national media uh, at, at the time. Labour is a racist party, the party of bigots and thugs where Jew haters are cheered. Labour is merging with the far right. Labour is the most anti-Semitic party in generations. The whiff of bloodlust rises from its annual conference. Party leader Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite and a racist, Britain's most prominent anti-Semite, the most dangerous racist in British politics who wants to reopen Auschwitz. And then in a uh, joint front page that was published uh, simultaneously on the same day by all three of Britain's communal Jewish newspapers, uh, the Jewish Chronicle, the Jewish News, and the Jewish Telegraph, um, there was the claim that a Corbyn-led Labour government would pose an existential threat to Jewish life. So that was the claim. And uh, it uh, that, that controversy, it ran off and on um, throughout Corbyn's time as Labour Party leader, often escalating to the level of national media headlines at times for days on end, I would say in its protractedness and its profile, um, it's that the, the hysterical register and the one-sidedness of the perspective, it was really unprecedented in modern uh, you know, British political history. Uh, that was the Labour anti-Semitism crisis. And you have to bear in mind, what was, what was the target of these claims it was Britain's main opposition party. It was, in fact, the largest party in Europe at the time. Uh, under Corbyn, the membership expanded to above half a million people. It was also a party whose previous leader, uh, Ed Miliband, uh, was Jewish. And he'd become leader by narrowly beating uh, his brother, David Miliband, also Jewish, of course, um, in the 2010 leadership election. Um, so it was a remarkable thing to witness and 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 live through now you asked about the political context in my opinion uh you know the crucial backdrop clearly uh is that in 2015 as a result for sure of impressive campaigning but also as out of a sheer political fluke jeremy corbyn uh was elected leader of the labor party and that was really uh 
unprecedented. That I mean, was the crisis. That was the cri- yeah, that was the crisis for Britain's political class. I mean, Corbyn was not just on the left. I mean, he was a radical critic of Britain's foreign policy. Um, he couldn't be bought off. And he was committed to a politics based on uh, popular organization. And the ho- as I mentioned, kind of the hope inspired by his candidacy uh, resulted in Labour's membership dramatically increasing to above half a million uh, people. So in against that backdrop, as I see it, the Labour anti-Semitism controversy it was basically, um, politically speaking, it was driven by three groups, overlapping but nonetheless uh, distinct, each for their own reasons. So first you had the pro-Israel lobby, um, for whom uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, a long-standing patron of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, long-standing um, Palestine rights campaigner. Um, for these groups, um, Corbyn's pr- uh, pro-Palestine politics was anti-Semitism. They perceived... They, they were perceived anathema. His, his, his position on, on Palestine and Israel was anathema to them. And that it was. was basically the extent of, of their agenda. Yes. And so that, that's one strand. Um, then you had the Conservative Party, which sought to use the Labour anti-Semitism issue uh, as a weapon against the Labour Party. Um, And then you had um, right-wing Labour MPs who were opposed to Corbyn's leadership, um, many on principle and others, um, pragmatically, they thought he would um, be unelectable. Um, And so they also used this issue um, as a stick against Corbyn's leadership. Then in the media, it was wall to wall. There was wall to wall coverage of and uncritical coverage of the anti Semitism claims because the media is um, part of the political establishment. So you had this the full breadth of the British political and media class um, united against Corbyn's leadership. Uh, now, Each of those three components um, were crucial for the uh, anti-Semitism smear campaign to be sustained and to gain the traction that it did. Uh, If it had been merely Jewish groups and pro-Israel groups making these allegations, uh, that alone, you know, they wouldn't have gotten a main mainstream hearing. Um, It was only because the full breadth of Britain's political class found those allegations useful against Corbyn, um, that they they were amplified to the extent that they were. On the other hand, if it had not been for the sort of stamp of approval, stamp of legitimacy given by those pro-Israel Jewish groups, then the allegations of anti-Semitism also wouldn't have gained traction. So both elements of the coalition were, were critical. But it seems to me that, you know, you said you had the um, uh, Jewish and Zionist group who very much had a very restricted one issue agenda. And then you had uh, the Conservative Party, where I think a lot of people would conclude, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Because it, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, partisan politics, as one would expect. And that perhaps the key constituency here was um, the internal Labour Party opposition um, uh, to Corbyn. Now, um, as as you've indicated, this crisis, if we can call it that, was very much a result of Corbyn's election to the leadership of the of the UK Labour Party. So let's take a closer look at the specific allegations that were made in this regard. Um, uh, First and foremost, uh, and reflecting some of the headlines you've just recalled, was that Jeremy Corbyn personally is an anti-Semite and uh, that he effectively gave free reign to or or encouraged anti-Semitism within the party and within um, uh, Britain more generally once he was elected leader. What what is um, let's look at that allegation first more closely. So um, during the twenty fifteen 
leadership election, we first saw claims being made then, not that Corbyn was himself an anti-Semite, but that he had shown poor judgment um, about some of his political associations. And let's just take, you know, the most prominent emblematic charge um, that was leveled at that point, which was that he'd once um, hosted um, in his capacity as a Labour MP, representatives of Hamas, uh, the Palestinian political movement, um, at Britain's uh, House of Commons, and that when introducing them, he'd uh, complimented them. So he referred to them as friends, uh, and he made some complimentary remarks um, about Hamas. Now, look, I, um, I think politicians are open to, you know, criticism, um, for such things, it's it, it's um, if if people want to say, well, it's maybe um, Jeremy Corbyn on that occasion, on some occasions, allowed his sympathy with representatives of um, uh, oppressed peoples or groups to um, result in kind of a, a, a romanticized picture of them, um, or lead him to compliment them, even as he doesn't share their politics. You can criticize him for that. But it's obviously a huge leap from that to say. Number one, Hamas is simply an anti-Semitic movement. That's all it's about, you know, um, because of this line from its old charter. And B, that if Corbyn was moved to say uh, positive words about them on one occasion, it must be because he shared their anti-Semitism. I mean, that is, um, you know, that's the flimsiest sort of guilt by association that you could imagine. Or as a leap of faith, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And... And it, I don't believe really that anyone actually believed that, that Corbyn uh, shared Hamas's politics because he said uh, nice things about them. I mean, no one was alleging that, well, Corbyn must therefore have um, shared Hamas's position on um, the relationship between church and state or um, women's rights or gay rights or anything else uh, of that nature. Um, obviously not. They know perfectly well um, Corbyn thinks Palestinians are, uh, uh, are an oppressed group, they have legitimate grievances, and that Hamas, um, even as he clearly doesn't share its politics on a whole range of issues, it's nevertheless an authentic representative of that group. Everyone knew that. So that's one kind of allegation which may, mainly um, relates to his uh, associations, you could say. Um, it's also, of course, an extremely selective line of reasoning. I mean, um, at the time, because everyone was focusing on this Corbyn's Corbyn having used this word friends to refer to Hamas. Um, so I just Googled for um, British government official statements referring to their friends, the Saudis, and obviously uh, found many such uh, many such statements. But no one therefore thought that Brit uh, British officials share all of those Saudi officials positions on social issues or cultural issues or or whatever. Um, the, in 2018, we really saw a shift from merely the arguments that Corbyn should have shown better judgment here and there about his associations to the claim that Corbyn was himself anti-Semitic. And, and this um, was after um, the Labour Party, if I'm not mistaken, overperformed in the 2017 parliamentary elections. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, in 2017, uh, it had been widely predicted that Labour would be wiped out. And in fact, they did much better than everyone expected. Um, and that actually led for a very short period of time to a receding of the internal anti-Semitism uh, controversies within the party, but they came back with a vengeance in 2018. Um, and uh, as I say, in 2018, we saw this escalation, or you could say radicalization of the, of the claim. Um, and it was now said that Corbyn himself was an anti-Semite. Um, and uh, the two main bits of evidence, I mean, I think calling them evidence is a bit too generous, uh, that were cited in support. Let's just look at them briefly. Um, the first was there was this controversy over a mural, a wall painting. So some years prior, there had been this wall painting in an area of East London. Um, it depicted a group of bankers playing Monopoly, and the Monopoly board was on the backs of the toiling masses, the working class, the poor. Um, that mural was then 
uh, whitewashed, like painted over. Um, Corbyn, in a Facebook comment at the time, he said he saw a, 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 another comment saying the mural's been whitewashed. And he replied, why? You're in good company. And he referred to Diego Garcia's mural, um, which had been uh, whitewashed because it included a depiction of Lenin. Um, now, the claim was that this mural was anti-Semitic and that therefore Corbyn, by questioning its uh, removal, was revealing his own anti-Semitism. Problem is, the mural wasn't obviously anti-Semitic. It turns out, comments from the artist later, he was intending to two of the bankers to be Jewish and he did have all kinds of dodgy views. But on its face, if you just look at it, it just looks like a bunch of bankers playing Monopoly. It looks like kind of anti-capitalist agitprop. And that's how Corbyn saw it. Uh, and when this was dug up again many years later, it wasn't a big story at the time. It became a huge story in 2018. Um, he said, sorry, I should have looked at it more closely. That's the end of it. There was no big, uh, there's no big issue there. Um, the second big piece of evidence uh, that was drag kind of dragged up in 2018 was a video clip from five years prior in 2013. And it showed Corbyn um, speaking at a pro-Palestine event. And he referred to um, Zionist, Zionists who lack an understanding of English irony, despite living here all their lives. And that was, and that was a reference as, to uh, British Jews, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it was construed as, as referring to British Jews, that he, by Zionist, he meant Jews, and that by commenting that they don't understand English irony, this was somehow a, a coded claim that Jews are not really English. Mm -hmm. That's how it was portrayed. And I think of uh, the former chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, responded by saying this was the most anti-Semitic comment uh, or the most racist comment by any political official since Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech in 1968. Um, well, what actually happened... Uh, and I, I should say, it feels very petty to get into the details, but this is what it was like responding to all of this stuff at the time. You have to, you have to really start drilling down into these silly um, minutia. But okay, let's uh, do that. Let's do it in relation to this. So there was an event um, where the Palestinian ambassador to the UK at the time, Manuel Hassassian, he made some joke um, that was relied on irony. Uh, there was a couple of right-wing Zionist activists, pro-Israel activists. Apparently, they were quite well known in the community as regularly showing up and, you know, behaving disruptively. This is what it was said uh, at pro-Palestine events. So um, they had a go at um, the Palestinian ambassador, seemingly not getting the irony uh, in his joke. Um, then at a spe another event a week later, these same... Zionist activists were in the audience and then Corbyn did a little dig at them saying, you know, whereas the Palestinian ambassador whose native language was not English, uh, he understood irony better than mm. these activists did. Um, so number one, by Zionists, he wasn't referring to... He was referring to specific Jews. individuals. He was referring to specific individuals. And number two, his whole premise of his comment, his dig, wasn't that they weren't English, but that they were. So they should know, they should have got right. the irony better than... Hassassian did. So anyway, the point is, Corbyn's been in public life for decades. Okay, if he was an anti-Semite, it shouldn't be hard to find evidence of it. Well, but and, and if I can interrupt you, and in your book, you actually um, produce a timeline of Corbyn's engagement on the issue of anti-Semitism, and you demonstrate that going all the way back to the 1970s, I believe from before he was a member of parliament, he had been a leading figure in not only um, the anti-racist movement in the UK, but also specifically keeping far-right figures like the National Front and so on out of areas of London that had a um, significant Jewish population. He had, and this is why it's so outrageous and disgraceful, this smear campaign against him, because they complete, on the one hand, these ridiculous minutiae, minutiae were cited as proof of his anti-Semitism. On the other hand, they totally whited out and ignored his long record 
as perhaps the most active, uh, not just rhetorically, but going to protests on the ground, um, the most active um, political official opposing racism and fascism um, in the UK. And in fact, um, you know, a, 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 a British Jewish historian, historian who is Jewish, but also historian of British Jewry, Jeffrey Alderman, whose politics are absolutely not Jeremy Corbyn's in any way. He said, Corbyn's record of taking initiatives on behalf of his Jewish con constituents is actually very impressive. So I think, in short, we can put to one side as a uh, really disgraceful um, libel, this idea that Corbyn was, was an anti-Semite. The, the, the second charge that was um, consistently um, made by his opponents and, and received prominent airplay in the media was that it, not only was Corbyn um, an anti-Semite, but that under his leadership, um, uh, anti-Semitism became pervasive uh, within the party. Yes. Um, the claim was um, that anti-Semitism had both, that the prevalence of anti-Semitism had both uh, sharply increased um, under Corbyn's leadership and had become indeed pervasive widespread within the Labour Party. The only problem with that claim is there's no good evidence of it at all. Um, so what kinds of evidence might shed light on that question? The first kind of evidence would be polling data about the attitudes of Labour Party members. Now, unfortunately, um, there aren't any published polls of Labour Party members on this issue. So we have to rely on these indirect polls, which are of, on the one hand, Labour supporters or Labour voters. On the other hand, um, people who identify as left wing, being on the left of British politics. What do those poll results show? Um, actually, before going into those specifically, the, I think it's helpful as a backdrop to say, what does, um, what's the state of the evidence about uh, anti-Jewish attitudes in the UK generally? The evidence shows that anti-Jewish um, animus in the UK, it's low relative to the situation in other countries, including other countries in Europe. And, it's and perhaps low uh, the lowest in Europe as a whole, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, exactly. It's the lowest in Europe as a whole. Um, it's also anti-Jewish animus is low relative to other kinds of animus. I mean, it's much lower than um, animus against Muslims or against Roma people, for example. It's also been stable over time, over a long time. It's certainly there's no evidence of any um, increase in or around 2015 when Corbyn um, was elected Labour Party leader. So that's the general picture. Um, now, as regards um, the political distribution of anti-Jewish animus, the evidence is uh, that um, levels of anti-Jewish anti, of anti animus are basically indistinguishable across the political spectrum, with the exception of the far right, where they're noticeably higher. It's traditional home. It's traditional home. Um, and um, that uh, in terms of negative stereotypes about Jews, uh, that again, they're not more prevalent among Labour supporters um, or people who identify as being on the left wing um, of the political spectrum. And if anything, they declined among Labour supporters, their prevalence declined during Corbyn's time as Labour Party leader. That's why if we want to quote the, um, uh, the 2016 Parliamentary Home Affairs Select Committee, which was incredibly uh, partisan, uh, bi biased against Labour, because, you know, to ensure its non-partisan nature, it, its representatives included MPs from the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. But of course, most Labour MPs hated Corbyn more than the Conservative MPs did. Um, but it said, um, there exists no reliable empirical evidence to support the notion that there's a higher prevalence of anti-Semitic attitudes within the Labour Party than any other political party. Um, and then a, a, a very um, thorough polling uh, study done by the Institute for Jewish Policy Research and published in 2017. This is a British that, organization. It's a British organization, probably the most, uh, I guess, uh, respected of the um, Jewish research institutes in, in the UK. Um, it said level, levels of anti-Semitism among those on the left wing of the political spectrum, including the far left, are indistinguishable from those found in the general population. So the attitudinal data really doesn't support um, these claims, um, such as we have, as I say, we just don't have 
data about Labour members specifically. Um, the other kind of evidence that is cited to support claims that anti-Semitism became pervasive um, within the Labour Party under Corbyn's leadership relates to incidents, anti-Semitic incidents. Um, and basically, the, the claim there is that, well, before Corbyn became leader, you, you hardly ever heard of complaints of anti-Semitism after he became leader became leader there were all kinds of on the one hand media reports and on the other hand formal complaints submitted to Labour's uh, disciplinary process against specific members of anti-semitism two things to say about that well as regards media reporting on the one hand that could just reflect a sudden interest in their on their part in finding evidence of anti-semitism in the Labour Party for obvious reasons the reasons I've already said. Number two, many of those media reports were simply untrue. Um, I personally investigated uh, to exhaustion one round of this media anti-Semitism controversy, namely that concerning Labour, the, La the Labour annual conference, uh, which took place in Brighton in September 2017. Um, that was the first conference after the surprisingly uh, uh, excellent, you know, or good performance um, of Labour in the June election of that year. Um, reading reports of it, you know, it was hard to tell whether this was a Labour Party conference or a Nuremberg rally. I mean, it, the the depiction was that this was just an orgy of anti-Semitism, up to and including Holocaust denial. So I looked into every single, literally every single media allegation in relation to that um, conference. And what I found was, without exception, all of the concrete allegations were either, rest, either rested on factual misrepresentations or they simply described things which were not anti-Semitic. And what was even more striking is that overwhelmingly those accused of anti-Semitism in those stories were Jewish. <laughs> so. Um, I called were, it at the time. Uh, these were Jewish anti-Zionist members of the Labour Party, correct? Or I, at least yeah. um, uh, Jewish members not known for their open support of Israel. Yes. Or, or yes. were closely associated with Corbyn. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I said at the time, you know, there's the famous... Uh, um, the famous cliche, two Jews, three anti-Semites. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so that's 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 what I have to say about the media reporting. Um, what about formal complaints um, submitted to the party? Um, here again, it's certainly true that um, the number of such complaints dramatically increased um, during Corbyn's time as party leader. First, as with the media reporting, that could just reflect that there was now an incentive to... Um, look for uh, evidence of anti-Semitism as a basis on which to submit complaints by opponents of Corbyn's leadership. And in fact, um, this is a crucial point to understand the whole dynamic. Most of the complaints, they, they didn't just, they weren't submitted by random ordinary members of the party arising organically from their interactions with their fellow party members. Overwhelmingly complaints um, submitted were submitted as part of dossiers or as a result of a kind of organized trawling of social media, the social media accounts of ordinary party members, sometimes going back years, by a small handful of people determined to, you know, look and look for and uncover evidence on which to submit complaints. In fact, these, sorry, these were apparatchiks in Labour Central Office, let's say, who were generating the evidence. No, I, I don't. Uh, it, it, rather, there were these bands of kind of um, online vigilantes. I see. Um, who did so uh, as volunteers, um, and perhaps also um, certain groups like the Jewish Labour Movement. Um, it's not. It's not completely clear. It should be said exactly how these dossiers were compiled and 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 uh, by who. Um, but it was these online groups that were then were trawling Facebook pages and so on. And submitting just just flooding Labour's complaint system uh, with complaints. I think there's a, there's a, to, to get a sense of this dynamic. Um, 
according to an internal Labour Party investigation that was commissioned under Corbyn's leadership and then leaked, um, it was found that half of all anti-Semitism related complaints in 2019, half came from one person. Mm. So, so these were not people or individuals um, claiming to have been victims of anti-Semitism and, and submitting complaints on that basis. It was more, let's say, interested third parties having claimed to have discovered evidence of anti-Semitism and on that basis submitting a claim to the party. Is that correct? Yes. And so if the number of such complaints increased under Corbyn, it reflected that there was now this concerted effort to mm-hmm. uncover such evidence. Um, now, I'd want to enter one caveat here. So we've said there's no attitudinal evidence and there's no evidence on the basis of incidents or complaints to support this claim that anti-Semitism became pervasive um, in the Labour Party under Corbyn's leadership. There's one caveat which I think should be entered, um, which is if you have two groups of people, let's just say, I don't know, on the left and on the right, and the level of anti-Jewish stereotypes um, is basically the same within both groups, let's say. But one group happens to be be talking about issues involving Jews much more frequently, uh, say, because they're interested in the Israel-Palestine conflict, um, or because they've been accused of anti-Semitism by a big campaign saying Labour's overrun with anti-Semitism. So then that leads them to start talking about issues around anti-Semitism and Jews. Then those latent, there, there are more, there are going to be more opportunities for latent uh, stereotypes to become expressed simply because you're, you're just talking about issues involving Jews or Jewish groups more frequently. Um, so that's true. Um, but what isn't true is that the reason why Labour Party members would be talking about issues involving Jews more frequently than others would is because of some anti-Jewish animus. No, it's because they're concerned about the oppression of the Palestinians, and it's because they were confronted with this wall-to-wall national media campaign saying that their party was full of anti-Semitism. And and this brings me to the third and perhaps um, arguably the most damaging allegation, which is uh, under Corbyn's leadership, Labour became an institutionally anti-Semitic party. Yes, um, so that really emerged in, in, I'd say, from 2018 onwards. Again, um, after, after Labour's overperformance in the 2017 elections. Yeah, um, and um, it really comprised two main allegations. Um, so the first had to do with how Labour defined anti-Semitism or how it refused to define anti-Semitism. And this was a controversy that erupted in the summer of 2018. Um, and it was really, it, it, uh, it dominated coverage at times for days on end. It was, it was, it was crazy. So, and it centered on um, Labour's, um, uh, the adoption by Labour's ruling body of a the National code of Executive con- Committee. It's a National Executive Committee um, of a code of conduct for anti-Semitism, which it, it, the reason it drafted and adopted this was a, as an attempt to try and satisfy people who had criticized its performance in relation to the handling of anti-Semitism complaints and so on. Um, now that code of conduct included a, a, a definition of anti-Semitism. Um, and here people might want to um, uh, also listen to our conversation last week um, about the which we I- discussed the IRA definition um, and and its problematic nature in depth. We did, and so I won't go into the full background of that definition here. The basically, suffice it for our purposes now. Um, there was this definition of anti-Semitism called the IRA definition, drafted by pro-Israel groups, and it and as uh, as they represented it, in, it included a number of very problematic examples of anti-Semitic. Um, statements, um, which could easily be used to um, conflate legitimate criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. And they'd managed to get this body called IRA, this intergovernmental body in 2016, they'd managed to get it to adopt part of that definition as its definition, but IRA only adopted, um, or other they only succeeded after IRA excluded from its definition of anti-Semitism all of these pro-Israel 
um, examples. And now, then there was a campaign to get the Labour Party to adopt not only the definition, but also the examples, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so this was the campaign in 2018. So, so it, Labour's Code of Conduct on Antisemitism, it incorporated the IRA definition of antisemitism and most of these examples, but it didn't incorporate all of the examples, specifically it included those examples which could most easily be used to shield Israel from legitimate criticism, for example, or for instance, um, uh, it didn't include um, the reference to applying double standards to the state of Israel as potentially anti-Semitic or re referring to Israel as the existence of a state of Israel as a racist endeavor as potentially anti-Semitic. It didn't include those. Q outrage across the board. It was, um, it was said that uh, by for a political party to dare to define anti-Semitism in line with its own politics and its own values was this height of arrogance and the supreme proof and demonstration that Labour was institutionally anti-Semitic. And in the course of that kind of um, contrived furore, um, it was claimed that for Labour to refuse to adopt or to amend even one syllable of even one word of even one sentence of one example of this sacred IRA definition, it thereby would re rejected the definition. Yeah, yeah, and rejected the definition in total. And just to give one quote from the time um, uh, to illustrate this hysterical campaign. Um, at the height of this controversy in August 2018, there was a statement published by seven, uh, by seven members of the UK's delegation to IRA. Um, it was published on the official IRA website, and it said, quote, I uh, quote it, any modified version of the IRA definition that does not include all of its 11 examples is no longer the IRA definition. Um, now, I don't need to belabor uh, for people who watched our previous discussion just why that's so breathtakingly dishonest, because IRA, IRA itself, itself didn't include no. any examples, no. any examples. No. And yet here you had seven UK delegates to IRA in a statement posted on the official IRA website and which IRA's permanent office circulated to all delegations, um, claiming that if Labour adopt changes any one of them, it is therefore rejected the definition. Now, how that statement, by the way, came to be, it's not uh, by the UK delegates. It's still not entirely clear, but suffice to note that the head of the UK delegation to IRA at the time was Eric Pickles, a senior Conservative Party official, and he then used that IRA delegate statement to publicly attack Labour over for rejecting the IRA definition. Okay, so that's the first strand of the claim of institutional anti-Semitism. And, uh, and then be, before we get to the second strand, if I'm not mistaken, the Labour Party leadership eventually capitulated and accepted the IRA definition uh, without amendment. Yes, it eventually um, it, it capitulated and it, Corbyn tried to make a last stand at the uh, meeting of the NEC, the National Executive Committee, and he said, okay, can we at least include a caveat protecting free speech? And he took the wording of that caveat wasn't his, he took it even from the, that Home Affairs Select Committee report, which recommended that that caveat be added, it, it wasn't accepted. So mm -hmm. they just completely capitulated on that. And I, and I don't blame, I don't blame Corbyn, by the way, for that. He, he just didn't have the support in the, mm -hmm. in the party's ruling body to oppose it. Um, so there was nothing in that controversy at all. The IRA definition stupid, they shouldn't have adopted it. And in fact, they did adopt it um the examples were never part of it anyway line and okay no. yeah the second strand of the allegation of institutional anti-semitism it had to do with um well it boiled down to the claim that corbyn's leadership office was, the acronym is lotto um, leadership of the opposition um uh, within the party had systematically intervened to obstruct the proper resolution of anti-semitism complaints on behalf of members accused of anti-semitism either because, I don't know, he's he's so anti-Semitic himself, he couldn't bear the thought that any good, honest anti-Semitic member would be, uh, you know, sanctioned because of it, um, or because he didn't want to accept kind of any standard of anti-Semitism 
any precedent that could then be used against him. That was all let, left murky. But the idea was that he was systematically, his office was intervening systematically on behalf of anti-Semitism complainants. Now, the main, we, we can get into the evidence around that in more detail when we discuss um, the HRC report, which we'll yes. get to. But basically, the short version is it's not true. There's no evidence of that. Um, on the contrary, in so the evidence we have suggests that um, insofar as the uh, Corbyn's office did intervene um, in the handling of anti-Semitism complaints, it tended to be on behalf of anti-Semitism complainants, not those accused of anti-Semitism. In other words, to speed up the investigation rather than to obstruct it. Yeah, to speed it up and I think at times also to advise for harsher sanctions. Um, Such as so, with, um, former London Mayor Ken Livingston, for example. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the, um, the, the overwhelming reason why everyone agreed it's common ground that uh, anti-Semitism, the complaint system in general of the Labour Party was, was terrible. Um, uh, the main reason for that, as, it, as it's emerged from various reports, um, the main reason is uh, it wasn't designed. I mean, it was designed to deal with a handful of complaints every year, handled mostly in an informal way. I looked at some of those complaints from... Uh, before Corbyn's time, yeah, involved like members, uh, I don't know, the one of them was urinating in another one's garden or things like that. Um, it wasn't designed, firstly, for a party of half a million members, and secondly, for this organized trawling of social media feeds to flood the system with a high volume of complaints. Um, so the overwhelming reason why most complaints were not just of anti-Semitism, but all complaints were just not dealt with, they, no action was taken on them for a long time, and they were mismanaged, like lost in the filing systems and so on, was just that the complaint system was not fit for, the inherited complaint system was not fit for purpose. The final thing to say there is that um, uh, up until uh, 2018, um, uh, spring of 2018, um, the complaints unit of the party, which was part of the kind of permanent headquarters of the party, it was in the hands of, it was overseen by um, officials who were factionally opposed to the Corbyn leadership. And what that meant in practice was that up until spring of 2018, the ability of Corbyn's leadership office to gain real insight into how that complaints unit was operating or to really change how it was operating, it, it seems to have been quite limited. And that's important because um, even though legally speaking, and we'll get onto the HRC report, which looked at this issue in a legal way in a minute, but legally speaking, there isn't labor, the Labour right or the Labour left. There's just the Labour Party. Right. Um, but politically, it obviously matters a great deal if the left is being attacked by the right of the party, over this poor performance of that, the complaint system. And the right is lot. responsible for it. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. quite significant that uh, the right was in charge of that unit um, up until spring of 2018. Yeah. You've, you've mentioned several times the Equality and Human Rights Commission's 2020 report. But before turning, that, I'd, uh, turning to that, I'd like to briefly ask you about um, Israel, because as you mentioned, a um, significant contextual factor to this entire crisis is Israel and preventing criticism of Israel and its policies. So to what extent did Israel and disputes about the definition of anti-Semitism in relation to Israel, in other words, conflating criticism of Israel and its policies with anti-Semitism, to what extent did those factors play a role in this crisis? So I think they played an important role. Mm. Um, number one, um, if you want to understand why uh, many British Jews, and I don't, I don't mean uh, kind of British Jewish organizations here, just ordinary British uh, Jews were not inclined to give Labour the benefit of the doubt or to give Corbyn's leadership the benefit of the doubt, part of the reason has to lie uh, lies in um, their politics around Israel and their distrust and disdain for the kind of pro-Palestine politics for which Corbyn was associated. The best indication of that is um, that the sort of drifting away of some Jewish voters from the Labour Party and of 
major Jewish uh, donors to the Labour Party. It didn't begin under Jeremy Corbyn. It began, began under his predecessor, Ed Miliband. Mm. As I mentioned, Ed Miliband was himself Jewish, but he was, um, on the Palestine issue, relatively more sympathetic um, to the Palestinian cause than, say, New yeah. Labour had been, than Blair. Um, and it was under the leadership of Ed Miliband that this um, policy to recognize a Palestinian state was, was adopted. Um, and it was, so it was under Ed Miliband that uh, you saw um, some Jewish voters shifting away from Labour and some Jewish donors drifting away. So that was clearly one important factor there politically. And then if you look at many of the um, Jewish organizations who um, led the anti-Semitism uh, fear-mongering um, over Corbyn's leadership, um, they were also pro-Israel groups. And it, it, was, they, it was clear to, that um, support for Israel was an important part of their political agenda. Finally, um, clearly in, when it came to controversies around the definition of anti-Semitism, those turned on um, the question of when should certain kinds of comments about Israel be considered as anti-Semitic. Um, I and think- we have evidence that the Israeli embassy played a role in, in this entire campaign? So, yeah, I think there were two issues where, firstly, I'm not entirely settled in my own mind about my answer to them. And B, I think they're quite complex to unravel. So the first question is, um, these Jewish organizations, um, which played a prominent role in publicizing allegations of anti-Semitism against the Labour Party, many of them, they doubled up as Jewish communal organizations. Mm -hmm. So you can call them pro-Israel groups, or you can call them Jewish groups. Um, they were both at the same time. And so when they say Labour's anti-Semitic uh, or Corbyn's anti-Semitic, are they speaking in their capacity as a pro-Israel group or in their capacity as a Jewish representative group? That's not easy to unravel. And in fact, I don't think it can be unraveled because, of course, in their own minds, um, their, their position on the Israel-Palestine conflict shapes their understanding of anti-Semitism and vice versa. Yeah. So, so that, for example, when I would say, when if I say, oh, the reason why this group, this Jewish group, um, uh, considers Corbyn anti-Semitic or labels Corbyn anti-Semitic has to do with its pro-Israel politics, it's not. I'm not having in mind this idea that they're thinking to themselves, aha, we know he's not anti-Semitic, but we don't like what he says about Israel, so let's just pretend that he is. I don't think that's mainly what's going on. I think it's rather that it's on account of their politics around Israel, their position on Israel-Palestine, that they view um, uh, certain expressions of support for Palestinian rights as anti-Semitic. Reflecting a more general trend where criticism or condemnation of Israel rather than one's views about Jews as an individual or collective has become the litmus test of whether or not one is anti-Semitic. Yeah, yeah, and so those are just kind of really bound up together within within the minds of of these people themselves. So that's one complex area. Um, then you've got the question of well, to what extent was the state of Israel orchestrating this controversy, or um, involved in it, or involved in it? Um, and there, the evidence that I've seen. Firstly, I don't think um, I don't think it has. I don't think its involvement was necessary. Um, because why? Because everyone, everyone knew that Israel didn't like Corbyn. I mean, it didn't take Israel to reach out to pro-Israel groups in the UK and say, oh, you should really do something about this Corbyn. You know, uh, it, and, and as you've indicated, the, the campaign extended well beyond um, uh, Jewish and pro-Israeli groups. It did. It did. So, so, so there were clearly um, other interests involved, and I would say, you know, the prime, um, the prime uh, interests involved were, as I say, the, the elite opposition to the Corbyn project. Period. But even if we look at the the pro-Israel subgroup of that anti-Corbyn coalition, um, I don't think they would have needed any explicit prompting 
from Israel. Whether or not they got it is another question, but I don't think you, they would have needed it to understand that Corbyn was an opponent, a political opponent. Um, number two, the kinds of evidence that I've seen um, cited in support of this idea that Israel played an important organizing role seems to me kind of circumstantial, involves basically, you know, um, certain figures who were employed by some of the uh, Jewish groups that made these allegations around labor, like the Jewish labor movement, say they'd previously been employed at the Israeli embassy um, or that they had uh, other professional or personal links with state actors. The, the, the reason why it's hard to know how much weight to place on that is we're talking about a very small circle of people, like the, the, the pool of people who are involved in um, um, establishment Jewish uh, political advocacy work and the pool of people involved in pro-Israel advocacy work, they, they, they overlap and they're very, it's a very small group of people. So it's hard to know how much weight to place on the fact that they know each other and they go to the same parties right. and, and so on. Okay, well, let's turn now to the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which in 2020 published a report on, on this issue that we're discussing. Did it vindicate claims that there was indeed an anti-Semitism crisis uh, within the Labour Party? And, and what did it conclude? So uh, the EHRC, um, it was asked by two organisations which had been active in um, this campaign around Labour anti-Semitism, the campaign against anti-Semitism on the one hand mm -hmm. and the Jewish Labour movement on the other. Um, the Jewish labor movement is, is a group of uh, labor members, uh, which is, let's say, a, a sub-organization of the Labor Party. Is that correct? It's affiliated to the Labor affiliated Party. Affiliated with it. Yeah. Um, uh, it. Historically, it was known as Poelitzion, but uh, and it, it traces its lineage back many decades. In fact, it seems as though it had basically become defunct and had been reactivated Um in order to contest these issues uh, under Corbyn within the Labour Party. Um, but in any case, those organizations um, asked the EHRC to investigate the Labour Party um, for breaching equalities legislation. And the um, EHRC is a um, uh, government appointed independent uh, monitor monitoring organization? Yeah, it's a statute, it's the statutory regulator. Um, for Britain's equalities legislation, in particular the 2020 uh, Equality Act. Um, it then began investigating allegations of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party in uh, May 2019, and it published its report in October uh, of 2020. Um, and those, its findings um, have, were then kind of heralded wi uh, widely as a authoritative vindication of the Labour anti-Semitism allegations. Now, they were no such thing, and it's worth kind of um, just going through them to show that. Um, so to begin with, the findings, cast, if, if you cast your mind back to the beginning of the conversation, the kinds of claims that were being made about the Labour Party, a ra basically as a racist party. Um, with a racist a, leader. With a racist leader. Um, uh, there was just a vast chasm between those claims and the, um, what the EHRC found. Um, there was also a chasm even between what the EHRC found and what it was formally asked to find in, by, by those two organizations whose submissions prompted the investigation. So those submissions asked the EHRC to find that the Labour Party had discriminated against uh, uh, members because those members were Jewish. The HRC report didn't find that at all. Um, the HRC was asked to find that Labour had victimised members who'd spoken out over anti-Semitism, like punished them for having mm -hmm. blown the whistle or complained about anti-Semitism. The HRC explicitly didn't di didn't find that. Um, the HRC was was also didn't make any findings personally in relation to Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. um, finally, um, the HRC didn't show that the leadership office um, intervened systematically to on behalf of uh, anti-Semitism complaints. I believe it um, found the opposite. 
it didn't find the opposite. It um, the it left open the question of on whose behalf were these interventions more often mm-hmm. kind of undertaken. But the uh, let's come back to it. But the available evidence basically suggests, uh, yeah, it was much more often on behalf of um, complainants than mm-hmm. respondents. Um, so uh, what did the HRC report, report find? Um, number one, um, the Jewish labor movement in its submission to the HRC, it alleged that, le- that the la- labor had played host to a relentless flow of endemic anti-Semitism, that anti-Semitic abuse is now common uh, and pervasive at every level of the party. HRC didn't find anything, it didn't provide any support for those claims. What did the HRC, EHRC do? It first culled from a number of uh, sources hostile, mostly hostile to Corbyn's leadership, 20, 220 concrete anti-Semitism allegations. It then selected 70 of these to look at in depth. Of those 70, it found two Labour Party officials, one uh, National Executive Committee member and former mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, who was a close Corbyn ally and an obscure local councillor. Two Labour Party officials out of thousands of officials and hundreds of thousands of members who it said had made between them a handful of harassing comments, comments that qualified as unlawful harassment of Jews. And we can come back to the, the to what extent was that a justified finding. Um, clearly, there's no basis for generalising from the finding of uh, harass uh, that two Labour Party officials had made harassing comments to a slur against the party of above half a million members. That's the first uh, e- big EHRC finding. Now, um, for the second, the, the EHRC found that the Labour Party, two Labour Party policies or practices amounted to unlawful indirect discrimination. That's a legal term, indirect discrimination. It basically means um, where, let, let's just say you had a social club. Um, if the social club said, we don't allow Jews to be members, that would be direct discrimination. You're treating people worse on account of them being Jewish um, or some other protected characteristic. Indirect discrimination would be, let's say the club said, um, oh, we, we're going to have our meetings on Friday nights. And let's say an unintended effect of that was would be that um, Jews who wanted to participate couldn't because that conflicts with Observant Shabbat. Observant Jews would no longer be able to participate. Yes. So such a policy um, could qualify as unlawful indirect discrimination unless um, unless a good it could be justified as, as a proportionate measure. So um, it, the HSC did not make any finding of direct discrimination against the Labour Party. It made the, it said that two practices qualified as indirect discrimination yeah. because it happened to be the case that um, Jewish members were disproportionately affected negatively by them. What were those two policies? The first was um, it said that Labour didn't adequately train its complaint staff. Okay, you should ad- you should adequately train your complaint staff. Fine, I think many organisations don't adequately train their complaint staff. Um, okay, it doesn't quite rise to the level of a Nuremberg rally, but uh, it do doesn't. Know. It doesn't. And actually, I mean, we could go. I don't think it's worth passing the legal reasoning about why whether this should no. qualify as indirect, but. That's let's just say that's I the think common la- sense will uh, will stand in for a legal yeah. analysis. Yeah. The second was this um, that um, Labour had this practice of um, uh, political involvement in the resolution of particularly high profile or politically sensitive complaints. Mm. Um, and that for a very short time period of uh, two months around the spring of 18 or uh, 2018, um, uh, the, uh, the Labour Leadership Office became involved in um, anti-Semitism complaints, mm-hmm. provided input into the resolution of those complaints. Now, the political sting of the institutional anti-Semitism charge, as we mentioned, was not that there were Labour that Labour's political office got involved in some way in anti-Semitism complaint resolution. It was that it systematically got involved to protect anti-Semites. That was the charge. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, Jewish organizations and those and others who criticized labor over anti-Semitism, they were loudly demanding that the political office intervene in anti-Semitism complaints to speed them up. 
or to ensure harsher uh, sanctions on people accused. Um, what the EHRC did not find that the, off, that the leadership office systematically intervened to protect people accused of anti-Semitism. What it argued rather was that any intervention, and it has this whole convoluted argument, which we don't need to get into, get into but that any intervention, even to speed up um, complaint resolution, even to urge harsher sanctions um, against people accused of anti-Semitism, that qualified as indirect discrimination against Jews. Interesting. So it was this very counterintuitive um, legal reasoning. I didn't find it persuasive. And um, actually, there was a, I kind of explained why at length in a pamphlet for, for Jewish Voice for Labour, which is also available as a free ebook from the Versa website. Um, but um, uh, uh, the point is, this was a, a technical finding about um, uh, can you intervene even to speed up complaints um, uh, legally or not? Um, it was it provided no support for the political charge mm -hmm. of that the office that the leadership office was covering for anti semites. Um, we we've covered a lot of ground, and there's still I think. Um, some key issues um, uh, to cover in, in the little time we have left. But I think um, one key question is you've, you've described um, the array of organizations and, and agendas that came together to eventually successfully unseat Jeremy Corbyn from the leadership of the Labour Party, which raises a question, to what extent did this controversy um, contribute to his defeat? So uh, <clears throat> I looked at this at the time, um, and I, I'll enter the, at the caveat that um, there might have been research published uh, more recently um, that I haven't seen. But I looked at it quite in depth at the time, and I came to the conclusion that it was um, that the anti Semitism controversy um, was certainly not the main reason for um, Labour's wipe out at the December 2019 election. The overriding reason was Brexit, clearly. Um, the, um, according to surveys by Populous, which is one of these polling companies, the anti-Semitism story, it didn't really cut through to, view, to, to viewers and to readers. Um, it wasn't highly salient for them. Um, I think insofar as it played a role and it clearly played a role, probably its indirect um, contribution to Labour's defeat outweighed its direct contribution. Um, on the one hand, it contributed to Corbyn appearing as weak, as a weak leader. And when pollsters asked people, um, why don't you see Corbyn as prime ministerial material, um, his weakness, perception of of him as a weak leader ranked very high as a factor. And the fact that he seemed to prevaricate over anti-Semitism, um, that he often adopted a sort of apologetic line, um, I think that contributed to his appearance as weak. Um, second, that um, the second indirect contribution so his inability to put an end to this story basically his inability yeah his inability to put an end to it um the second indirect contribution was just the demoralizing effect that it had on labor members and the disorientating effect i i mean i was um you know involved at the time and it, it was it's hard to convey how just draining it was um this constant um firefighting and um, disorientation because also you know um, certain or many left-wing commentators um, didn't come out loudly against the validity of these allegations mm -hmm. and so um, I think I think that was also a significant negative mm -hmm. effect. And, and finally, Jamie, um, Corbyn, of course, um, resigned the leadership in 2019. He was succeeded by Keir Starmer, who has used this um, issue to basically launch a, um, a purge 
of um, uh, of the party. And and ironically, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, Jewish members of the Labour Party are being disproportionately targeted by allegations of uh, of anti-Semitism. Um, so my final question to you, and, and there was also, I think, a leaked internal Labour Party report that um, uh, that suggested or demonstrated that um, the opposition to Corbyn within the Labour Party played played also a key role in, in fomenting this crisis. So my final question is, um, how do you see the situation currently and more broadly, um, what can this particular crisis teach us about how such um, uh, contrived controversies should be responded to? So the current situation is not good for people who are on the left of the Labour Party. Um, many have left or been expelled. Um, and in general, the leadership um, has set as its strategic priority to demonstrate in every way possible that um, its, uh, uh, its repudiation of Corbynism and everything involved with Corbynism, which is remarkably dishonest because Keir Starmer won the leadership election on a Corbyn continuity platform. Um, but um, he's not only not paid any price for that brazen dishonesty, but uh, media commentators fall over themselves to praise the seriousness of his willingness to break pledges when necessary. Um, and, and, and is my observation correct that um, Jewish members of the Labour Party are being disproportionately... Almost certainly, so, almost certainly. The, 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 um, it's, it's, it's impossible to say with absolute certainty because it's not known how many Jewish members are there are of the Labour Party. So you have to use estimates. Right. Um, but it's, it's almost certain that that is indeed the case. And, you know, uh, the, um, the main a, a body of Labour members who are Jewish, who are also supportive of Corbyn's leadership and Corbyn's can candidacy. It's called Jewish Voice for Labour. Mm. Um, I think every member of its executive um, has been uh, accused of anti, formally had a complaint of anti-Semitism um, directed against them. Several have been uh, suspended or expelled. So there's, there's an orchestrated, you know, mm. campaign against Corbyn supporting Jews. Um, in terms of lessons to be taken, um, I think uh, two big errors were made um, by many. And uh, we should try to, I think, if, if this happens again or when this happens again, we should I avoid think when them. this happens again. Well, that depends on uh, if the left becomes uh, gets into a position to potentially take control of the Labour Party again. Um, but yes, if, if if and when that happens, then for sure the same playbook will be deployed against the left. Um, number one, basically not to accept as a litmus test of one's seriousness about opposing anti-Semitism certain factual claims about, for example, the prevalence of anti-Semitism um, that there's just no evidence for. The problem, the, the reason, it's, uh, there was this constant temptation, basically, on the part of even Corbyn supporters or members of the Corbyn leadership team not to contest or to dispute um, certain claims that were made that weren't true or for which the evidence, you know, didn't support. Um, for, because for fear of appearing uh, guilty as charged. Exactly. For fear of appearing guilty as charged, they thought, OK, look, just instead, just affirm that you are opposed to anti-Semitism and all, and all the rest of it. That's a terrible it was a terrible strategy, because the point is, is that once, let's say, even Corbyn and his supporters conceded that there was a big anti-Semitism problem in the Labour Party, it um, it then became impossible to enter the mainstream conversation without accepting that as your premise. So the whole conversation then becomes unmoored from reality. And then the whole um, conversation becomes focused on what are you doing and not doing about it. Yes, exactly. And to the point where now, um, you know, when, when Corbyn was then was has now been effectively, you know, excluded from the party, he had the whip removed from him because he said that anti-Semitism is a big problem, but its scale 
was exaggerated for political purposes. And that is now unsayable. It's unsayable. Um, so that was a big mistake. Um, in fact, treating an issue seriously um, means treating it soberly. It means um, if you actually care about anti-Semitism, it doesn't mean hysterically ranting and making claims that are demonstra demonstra demonstrably um, not supported by the evidence. Um, it means insisting that um, we stick to the evidence. So that's the first um, thing I'd want to say. The second is to also reject as a litmus test for seriousness about opposing anti-Semitism, one's willingness to sanction, expel, drive out, exclude people because of uh, speech, things that they've just said. Um, the Labour Party rule book up until uh, 2017, I think, or maybe I think it was 2016, actually, um, it said that um, members would not be excluded um, merely because of their political beliefs. And that was changed in the context of the anti-Semitism controversy to say, with the exception of remarks that are deemed bigoted or prejudiced um, and so on and so forth. The problem is what constitutes bigotry and prejudice it's and there it's we get into the question yeah and there we get into the whole discussion again about the ira definition and uh, yes and so i do. don't want to say i don't I, I don't want to deny that there's some there's some there's difficulties there about should literally anything be permissible to say within a political party but i do think at the very least one should err very much on the side of permissiveness when it comes to freedom of discussion and debate. Jamie Sternweiner, thank you once again for sharing your very detailed uh, knowledge and insights with connections on this crucially important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.